Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Funky Marketing Podcast. Today I have the pleasure to uh, welcome one of the guys that uh, kind of helped me get through the times in the, in the pandemic when we started. He recorded all kind of uh, videos on, on YouTube, on LinkedIn over those, day, those days. And while I was working, like I was watching them and it kind of entertained me. And, uh, <laughs> Good, man. And I learned something. So, Jake, welcome to the show. And I will ask you just to tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, I'd love to hear that, man. Sometimes that's what I do too. You know, I binge watch my own videos, right? I grab a cup of coffee and I'm like, man, that guy actually knew what he was talking about sometimes. Um, <laughs> so it's really great to, to connect and to be here. I'm Jake Dunlap. I run a sales consulting company, Scaled Consulting. Um, started the organization about seven years ago now. Uh, formerly, I was a VP of sales at Glassdoor and a few other startups. And, and really, you know, what I'm out to do, man, is help to create a new future for sales. Um, that I think that there's some, some ways that sales is perceived. I think there's a lack of standardization. And so what we do is we work with organizations that are looking to optimize components of their, you know, demand generation, sales process, account growth process. And really, you know, we, we go head to head against a mix of, you know, kind of internal folks, the McKinsey's of the world, the smaller consulting firms, and really where we differentiate is that modern approach that, you know, we have technical resources who are amazing at sales tech. We've got, you know, forward thinking sales leaders. And, and so, you know, we really work with a lot of companies that are trying to build that replicability. Um, and that's what I'm up to now. You know, before that, I was born in Iowa, which is some people know that. If I was in my home office, I could show you my birth certificate. This thing literally, I kid you not, man, it looks like it was written in like the 1800s. It's like, just like this old wrinkly yellow thing from like the middle of nowhere, Iowa. Uh, then moved to Kansas City, grew up in Kansas City. Uh, big Chiefs and Royals fan now. Um, so yeah, man, excited to kind of mix it up and talk through it. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. I, I was like, my hometown period here in Serbia is also like they used to call it um, the place that will always be left on the side because it's <laughs> on the south, on the south, like it's Bulgaria over there. And like nobody was paying attention to the city. And while we have this, uh, this government for like, I don't know, 12, 13 years in, in my hometown, we had the opposition. So actually they created the project management team and got all the EU funds from cross border cooperation. And now like Pirot is the city that, uh, that moved forward more than any other city in the, in the country, except like the main city, Belgrade. And it's yeah, of course. kind of interesting. And now we have the, the, same, uh, the same local government as the, the state one, so we can get money out of them too. So <laughs> I love it, man. That's awesome. Kind of interesting. So tell me a little bit about, about the childhood. How, how, how was that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, I grew up in a very, I don't know what, what class you'd put us in, but, you know, we, again, I grew up in the Midwest, which I don't know, I don't know what the Serbian equivalent of the Midwest is, but like, I don't know, it's like parts, you know, literally we grew up in the middle of nowhere. I lived on a corn, a corn farm for three years. Um, we lived in a, you know, a duplex. My brother and I shared a bed until I think I was in like fifth grade. Uh, when we moved to Kansas City. So I came from, you know, some hard, very, very hard working family. You know, my mom got up at, I think, 4.30, 5 o'clock every morning to go to work. And so I learned really early on, neither of my parents, you know, graduated from college. You know, they, they got into it. They had me when they were very young. They had me when they were 20. And so, you know, they had to get out there and work and make it happen. And so I think I learned a lot of, you know, that mindset of, you know, you've got to get out there and provide and do what you've got to do very early on. And then, uh, you know, for me, I played sports growing up, basketball and ran track. I know we shared some, some back and forth of my basketball skills uh, back from 1998. I think that that video was from with that sweet low post dump that I had there. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. But, but no, man, then went to school in Missouri. Uh, took five and a half years to graduate. I had a lot of fun. Let's put it that way. Um, decided that, hey, I needed to get my act together and, and candidly just realized that I was naturally very good at sales. That, you know, I did a few jobs in college. I worked almost full time throughout college too. And once I got into sales, I was like, oh, I can get past my own ego. 
I can try new things. I don't take rejection personally. And so I found that I naturally had a lot of traits that equaled being good at sales. And so got into that. And then, uh, you know, early career, when I graduated, I got into sales for professional sports. So for a major league baseball team, and then for a um, uh, national hockey league team. So the Phoenix Coyotes. So I've met Wayne Gretzky, which I know that'll, that'll resonate in Serbia as well, too. Um, so that was kind of cool, but, but no, and, and, and then over my career, I just started to realize what a science sales was too. I had these kind of natural abilities, but I started to realize that there really is a formula and a process to it that, you know, there's a, there's a buyer journey or a customer journey that's, that can be optimized versus, you know, it's kind of this art that I think a lot of people try to make it out to be. Interesting, interesting. Like I find out that a lot of guys who are now in marketing and in sales have like the, the sports background, and it's <laughs> kind of interesting. Is that like competitive spirit? Also, like all kind of different stuff. Like when I was uh, when I was playing basketball, like my father was uh, was a basketball coach, and um, like when I just started, nobody wanted to do like uh, to say things for the media. And like I was the captain of the team, and I was my father was the coach, so I had no choice, <laughs> and I needed to go over there. So that's kind of where I started, and just like uh, I was an introvert a guy who loves to read, who can play with himself, uh, who don't need others. Uh, then I like started to to become more an extrovert, and like use that <laughs> use that in my advantage, sort of. Uh, yeah, I was kind of like that too, man. I was like a late bloomer extrovert that, you know, I kind of kept to myself for a long time. And then again, I, then I realized like that just didn't work, man. It didn't work to pick up girls. It didn't work for a lot of things, you know, like, you know, maybe I'll just try this new approach and, you know, <laughs> my life, those things all improved. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was, uh, it was funny. Like in high school, like we in, in Serbia, so the, the they call it like the Mecca of basketball besides Lithuania. In yeah, Europe. exactly. Yeah, of course. And like at the time when I was like in primary school and the high school, like no football players were more popular than us on like whatever it is. Like we didn't even have to bother to, to approach the girls. Like we, we just <laughs> choose. And I, I think that I have some traumas because like after that, I never dated a girl that uh, approached me first. So <laughs> kind of change all that. So uh, tell me, um, how does it happen that you realize that you're good in, in selling? Like, I didn't realize that up until uh, maybe even this year, because when I, when I look back, like, okay, in a year for the new business, I, I closed like 31 deals. And I'm not like the natural sales guy. Uh, they all came inbound, so it's it's a little bit different. But sure. tell me, when did you realize that, like you were good in that? Yeah, I think um, I'm trying to. You know, look, I I didn't really do this stuff like you know when I was a kid early on. I did, you know it wasn't something like I was uh, you know starting lemonade stands or anything. I'm sure I did at some point, but you know it really was I I think in college where again, I got a job in telemarketing. So I had a few different jobs. I was selling long distance, which a lot of you might not even know what that is. It used to be, you used to have this long distance thing you added onto your phone that, you know, people, you got charged for it. Um, you know, so I'd have to call and get people to switch long distance. And then I went and did this uh, selling vacation packages um, over the phone. I had to get people's credit card over the phone. And I realized that you know, you, you know, when you know you're good is you're outperforming everybody, <laughs> right? And so I, but, but the reason I was outperforming most people is I was willing to take, take chances, um, make people a little uncomfortable, like, look, hey, you said you wanted to do this, John, what's the issue here? And I think a lot of people are very nervous of confrontation. I've always found, you know, my mom called me Kaya for know-it-all, right? And I've always found I don't, I don't shy away from confrontation or I don't shy away from a, a disagreement. And I feel like you, you, to be great at sales, you have to be comfortable with that. You've got to be comfortable with a little bit of discomfort if you're really going to win and you're really going to be successful. Totally, totally agree with that. Like I was telling people, I think just yesterday that like, there are some people here in Serbia, like one of the guys who is like influencers when it comes to finance, the guy that all the media televisions are calling to talk about finances. 
especially now when it's like New Year, Christmas is approaching and all those things. Yeah, sure, of course. And like um, we started to, to take care of their business and we needed to include him as a, as a CEO who will also share some things on LinkedIn and he has some these kind of interesting stories, interesting approaches that kind of change the narrative. But he didn't ever experience direct feedback. You know, LinkedIn is not television. So when he got people uncomfortable, then the feedback came and he was like, oh man, did I say something politically incorrect or did I like, no, it's just like you cannot expect everybody to agree with you. That's just not going to happen. Well, that's LinkedIn, dude. I mean, LinkedIn in particular is where it's the softest place on the internet. You know, for me, look, and, and I, I don't get much, even on other platforms, you know, YouTube and Instagram, I don't get a ton of feedback, but look, if you can't, if you're going to put yourself out there, you got to expect people aren't going to agree with you. And so I feel like that's where a lot of people struggle is that they get on YouTube and uh, then they surround themselves with people. Oh, great job. Great job. Is because people are scared to be like, dude, that's lame. I'll tell you, that's, that's my, my first experience advertising on Instagram. I kid you not. You know, we were at advertising posts, et cetera. And literally the 16 year old kid, I'll never forget it. Cause it was the very first time we advertised. I wake up in the mornings, you know, five, six a.m., something like that. And I'm like, oh, I, no, this ad got a comment because we just had started doing it. And it's like literally, there's a 16 year old kid who said, "lame." <laughs> like, and I'm just like, man, this kid, you know, man, forget this. Like, but then I'm like, look, this is good. Like, that's fine. Like, that's learning, right? Okay, that was lame. This is cool. And then trust me, since then there's been plenty of comments. But I feel like a lot of people, you know, you've got to be comfortable with that and not take it personally and not let it discourage you and understand that it's all a journey and a process. For me, a post performs well, I learn something. It performs poorly, I learn something. You don't get too highs on the high, you don't get too low on the lows. You know, and, and I think a lot of people, and that, that goes back to it's a similar skill for sales, right? Like win a deal, great. Lose a deal, why did I lose it? And not having so much emotion tied to the outcome, but instead making it more about the journey and the process. Yeah, exactly. Totally. So um, tell me about the biggest challenge that, that you have, that you actually Big had in a career. Uh, sorry if you, if you hear the noise, like guys are going out of the office. Uh, but <laughs> like, okay. what was the, the one challenge that you can say, okay, this is something when I think from, from now, from this perspective, this is something that, uh, that really was tough for me. Yeah. I mean, I'll give like a, I'll give a learning and I've told this story a few times, you know, I was what, 27, I think 26, 27. Um, and I, I was, I wanted to get promoted and I wanted to get promoted into leadership. I'd been in sales for two and a half years. I'd already managed an inside sales team at the, at the Tampa Bay Rays. And I went to my director, my boss's boss. And I said, look, Evan, I want to get promoted to a manager position. And he goes, well, that's not a goal. I go, well, what do you mean it's not a goal to get promoted? He goes, well, it's not a goal. He's like, because I control it. I control if you get promoted. I choose to promote you. And so it can't be a goal. And that for me was a really eye-opening experience of like, wow, oh, okay, I guess he's right. And he's like, so what can you control? And this is where I started to learn about this concept of reverse engineering outcomes, which is, he said, Jake, you can control your activity level every day. Are you putting in the work? Are you setting a good example? Are you mentoring people? Are you setting up trainings? Are you doing that? And then obviously, look, you're hitting your numbers is kind of a prerequisite, like you have to do that. But if you're you know, leading by example from an activity standpoint, you're leading by example from mentoring, you're hitting your numbers on a consistent basis, um, that equals being ready to be promoted to manager. And that was such an eye-opening thing for me. And I think a lot of people go through their whole career and never learn that lesson that, you know, you've got to align your career to the people that you attach yourselves, definition of success, not yours. And for the longest time, I used to think I was a special flower that if I just did really good at sales, I'd get picked. And then I, and, and, and he helped to change my whole perspective about setting goals that are based on what other people's bar is for success, not just mine. And so I think that that's one of the most powerful lessons that I learned, you know, that like early middle stage of my career that I think can be, you know, a lot of people can, can relate to. Yeah, de definitely. It's, uh, I didn't look at it from that perspective and it's, and it's nice when you, when you think about it, like, okay, these are the things that I can do. These are the things that don't depend on me, but I can do 
everything that I can to get there and then see what happens and then react based, based on that. That's exactly it. As opposed to just you, you doing the things you think you should do, but, but that does none of that matters. It's what somebody else, if you're looking for a promotion, it's what they think you should be doing, not what you, and if you don't know what that is, go ask, go ask a, trust me, every leader would love for you to do that. Every leader would love for you to come to them and say, look, I want to be your number one, whatever. What do you need to see from me specifically to equal that in your mind? Not in my mind, in your mind. Perfectly said. Uh, I was talking with, with Megan Bowen from Refine Labs and we were talking yeah, about Megan. like, um, how can you, can you actually uh, do an impact on the CEO that doesn't get like marketing or sales? Like you can sometimes, when you, but you need to get uh, to show them things from their perspective. Like uh, we have a lot of IT tech companies and a lot of founders are developers. So developers like look at the things like we solve problems and uh, like you need to show them from their perspective, like what's the change that's going to happen? What's the problem that we are solving and how does it happen? And like those kind of things, there are a lot of those kind of examples. And like, I wish I can, <laughs> Let me add some personal here. Uh, I wish I can teach my mother now in uh, 60 years <laughs> to, to kind of not worry about what other people think and what's their agenda. Good and, luck with that, man. Else. It's not going to happen. Exactly. Good luck with that. So let's, let's get a little bit about, I don't want to ask you about uh, like bad examples of sales, but I want yeah, sure. to get you into another bucket and ask you like, what do you consider as bad or see as bad examples of like marketing? Yeah. I mean, I think what I feel like has happened in marketing, I'll get, I'll get very uh, high level and then let me take a tactical for you too. Um, here's what I feel like has happened with marketing is marketing. We used to really value brand right back in like the nineties and two early two thousands. Um, you know, like we, we appreciated that, man, if you build a brand, then people come inbound. You know, we get this whole thing. And then what happened is really the rise of marketing technology. And that started about early 2000s, right? And then what happened is it gave rise to the quant marketer who is like, look, what's the attribution of an activity to a lead? And that sounds good. Oh, that sounds great, right? Like I can directly attribute one-to-one -one between this activity and the lead. The issue is, you're short circuiting all these things that you can't, you're, you're now completely devaluing brand. And I, what I, what I think most marketers don't realize it's, and it's this type of direct attribution and building a brand and a reputation around your company. It's, and, and so I feel like right now, the biggest issue I see with marketers is e they're either too far one way or the other. They're brand marketers who don't get the quant side or they're quant marketers who don't, who don't appreciate or really understand the value of brand. And I feel like if you don't, it's both. And I feel like you've got to understand, like I'll give you a good example. Let me tell you about Scaled, for example. And I think that this will bring it to life for a lot of you marketers. And we're a consulting company. What do consulting companies do? We put out industry insights and uh, interesting content, just like a good little consulting company. So what happened in 2018, so two years ago, I decided, uh, I looked at, we did this white paper, this, this big ebook on GDPR, right? All of you, you know what GDPR is. It's this general data pri protection and rights, privacy and rights. I can't remember. Um, we did this beautiful book, distilling it down for marketers and sales leaders, exactly what you need to know. We, we gate it, we put it out on social. It does okay. It gets, you know, a hundred something downloads or whatever. And I'm like, holy shit, do you know how much work we just did? And that's all that we got. I said, forget that, man. So we were literally putting out a blog post every week, doing eBooks every 60 to 90 days. We didn't do a single blog post or a single eBook for a year. And we focused only on short form social content building brand. That year we closed hundreds of thousands of dollars. The next year in 20, last year, yeah, 2019, we closed millions. We, we closed deals, six figure deals with people who would call in or come inbound. I don't even know what you guys do, but I want to work with you. So, that worked better. It was better for us to give the content ungated for free and in bite-sized chunks than to have to capture every email address. And so for my marketers out there, I want you to think about the yin and the yang. It's both. And if you've went too far one way or too far the other way, you're not going to be successful or at least as successful as you could be.
Very long answer to a short question, but I think it's an important one for a lot of marketers out there. Yeah, definitely. And, and I like when somebody says the things that, that I'm thinking also, so I don't need to say it. Uh, it's kind of, uh, sounds good. And we, I think we need to talk more about those things because like I expected things to change like in 2020 and we moved a little bit, but not that much. Like things didn't change that much as I, as I expected it to change. Like I'm looking uh, at like- Marketers weren't ready. I don't think they were ready, man. I mean, look at, look at like mm -hmm. all these B2B marketers. They had all this budget for events and trade shows. And they got punched in the mouth. They didn't even have a plan B. They weren't like, all right, cool, let's go. Let's digital, boom, we're gonna be this. We're a content engine now. We're gonna build a brand. Like, I feel like you've gotta always be testing and iterating, et cetera, versus just going back to the same old well. And marketers do it, sales leaders do it too. Like, you know, how many sales leaders got caught with outbound, you know, flat footed? Oh, the sequences aren't working. Well, okay, well, iterate. You know, some of the companies that I respect and some people I know, what they did, man, when COVID hit, they spent the whole weekend, rewrote 60 sequences, preloaded them back in, and then redeployed them to the team. You know, and, and I feel like hopefully what, the, what some of this did is it created that always on mindset. We gotta be thinking about the next thing, the next thing, because the me too and the copycats are gonna start to happen faster and faster and faster. Those, it used to be that you could, you know, have a marketing, you know, engine that would, that same play would work for a long time, but now, man, those cycles are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And so whether you're in sales or marketing, you have to have that always on mindset. And it shouldn't be stressful. It's just, just, all, just never being satisfied. You know, you're like, okay, cool. We did this. Now, how can we break it? That's our new bar. Now we did that. How do we break it? Now that's our new bar. And it's just, you know, continuing to build on that. Interesting. Interesting things are, are happening. And I wanted to kind of pick your brain uh, on like, what do you see happening, happening next? Like COVID is gonna, is gonna be here for some time now. Yeah. And like when it tends, like we're gonna have probably a recession uh, and a lot of businesses got out of the work. So what are maybe two or three things that you will double down on from, from your perspective? I mean, look, it's different every, I think every part of the world is being affected slightly different. Um, you know, the thing that's universal is this, is that with the right value proposition, almost every product is marketable. And I feel like, you know, there was a conversation I had really early with a company um, and now this company is doing extremely well. It's a company that does outsourced IT services um, here in the United States. And, you know, it's a lot of people in that industry. But I talked to their VP of sales. I said, look, you are no longer in the outsourced IT. You are now in remote work infrastructure and security business. It's the same product, same thing. Boop, flip it up, right? This company, Trip Actions here in the US. You're no longer in travel management. You're in travel safety business. And so I feel like a lot of people have got to get more clever. They've got to make changes to their product. They've got to think about what's going to happen in this virtual world. So... I just think it's, you know, have you, you know, my, my advice would be, have you thought about how you're going to need to engineer your sales and marketing team for a 100% digital sale to where you will never be, imagine a world where you're never face-to-face, -face. never, right? Are you going to engineer a process that's going to be so amazing? I think 2021, I've been using this frame trademark TM right now, Jake Dunlap said it, which is digital sales experience. Are you creating an experience for your buyers or are you just going through the next zoom to the next zoom to the next zoom? And so I really encourage all of, all of you, both marketers and sellers to really think, especially in B2B about the digital experience. Is your sales team delivering an experience digitally to break out of the norm, to differentiate yourself? Or is it just the same old boring zoom number 10 and they're mailing it in? Cause I'm telling you, a lot of companies are starting to think about this now. You know, and these, the poor thing, these, man, these, these field reps are not used to it. They're used to being out in the field. What's that? What's like the, the liquor of choice in Serbia? Like when you have like an after, like an after dinner drink, what's the liquor of choice? Yeah. Usually it's rakia. Is it? Okay. All right. They're yeah. out, they're used to being out there, having some vodka, just having a little, and guess what? It ain't happening. So what are you going to do instead? Can you do a virtual vodka? Could you ship me two bottles of different vodka? And, and for my company, we could do a vodka tasting. Now that's interesting. 
right? Like there's different things that you can think about that um, when a hundred percent digital world, how can you create some of those moments as a seller? And I think it's, and, and as a marketer, I think it's more important that you're thinking about both now more than ever, as opposed to just getting the messaging about, about what your product does. Love it. And we need to get more into like also uh, having an experience, but to have an experience, we need to get more creativity, more emotion, more feelings into into b 2 Like I saw your live the other day, like when you were dancing and with music and everything else, like, <laughs> said, man, that's, that's kind of the things that I want to see. Like I was watching the other day, uh, YouTube and I got the commercial for, for Milka, uh, with you got the love. Uh, actually kind of like the, the old guy in the, in the school is fixing things around, but he, he cannot speak. He speaks the sign language. And so like the girl that dances sees him and like when they are dancing, performing the final performance, uh, they end and she sees that this old guy doesn't understand. So she learned the sign language. So she right. translates, you got the love and everything. Like I said, man. I wish we had like these kind of emotions in B2B. It would mean like the industry is finally changed. It'll like, happen, completely. man. Completely. It'll happen. Everything B2C comes to B2B just 10 to 15 years later, sometimes more. And, and I think, you know, radical transparency is another thing I'm really big on of, look, just laying out all the steps and agreement up front. Talk about the competition. Kaka. There's a lot of data, you know, we've been doing a lot of research on this. There's a lot of data about talking about the competition in the first call and leads to an increase in close rate. Talking about price on the first call leads to an increase in close rate. And so I just think, you know, customers are like, look, dude, stop with these games, dude. Just give me the, give me the information. Just give it, stop with this dance. So anyway, man, I know we got to wrap up, but uh, I hope there was some, some good gems in there. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Who knows? Uh, anyway, uh, tell me one thing outside of, uh, of the business, outside of work, that maybe needs more attention. Like, is it music? Is it sports? Is it something else? Oh, I love that question, man. Um, what needs more work outside? You know, for me, and again, I'm, I live in Austin now, right? I moved from New York to, to Austin. In, in the United States in particular, it's the homeless situation that I feel like right now we have created a horrible system, you know, Democrat and Republican, that is not dedicated to solving some of the root causes, whether it's veterans coming home, mental illness, drug abuse. Um, and it's just, it's starting to overtake downtowns. You know, if you go to San Francisco right now, I mean, it's, it's really tough to move around sometimes or not get, you know, uh, yelled at or screamed at. And Austin's starting to get like that, Seattle, and I feel like we've got to try to think of more creative solutions for how we can support and help people get out of homelessness, not just, you know, put a bandaid on it. So that would be my one kind of area to call attention to is what can we do in tech or as a society, you know, you're in San Francisco, you're in downtown San Francisco, you have the biggest companies in the world, Twitter's office, and there's a guy shooting up outside of Twitter's office. There's a shooting downstairs of Zendesk's office, you know, what can we do to help to be a part of the solution in the communities whenever we do have that, that opportunity? So that would be my, my shout out. Yeah, very nice, very nice said. I was reading about it, uh, about that situation in Austin and everything else, like how the, the industry is moving to Austin and on the other side, we have all those kind of issues that, that you mentioned. Um, yeah, Ben, uh, for the end, I always ask people uh, to, did we miss something? Is there something that you wanna, want to go into it? I love or, it, man. Or a message to, for the end? Yeah, no, look, I mean, if you want to get at me, you can find me on LinkedIn, right? Just, just I'm the forward slash Jake Dunlap, D-U-N-L-A-P. Um, and yeah, look, I think if you're looking to up your sales game, you know, definitely, like you said, go check out my YouTube. You know, we put out, I've got, I think, 300 something sales videos on there. So anything you're tackling, any issues, I really encourage you, go take a look at it. You know, like I said, I, I, I talk about this stuff because I love it and I, I enjoy it. It's a passion. Um, and I think that that would be my takeaway for you is to make sure that you're doing something that you enjoy, you're passionate about, you know, we all have those days where we can't wait for the end of the day, but that doesn't mean that you're not bringing the passion during the day because it's something that you love. So make sure you're doing something that you're passionate about, uh, or working toward getting to that point. Yeah, man. Passion, passion is, uh, is what's important. I agree, dude. 
Yeah, I, I was just talking with uh, with few few girls that uh, I would possibly hire, and like one thing I wanted to hear out of them is is the passion. And uh, I need I need to say this because uh, I was like impressed. One girl sent me a message. She ha she even has a Gmail account which says like Funky Marketing DCN Barcelona, and and she was I like, love that. I have the profile Funky Marketing. I have everything like. I want to do something with a passion because like I'm the right, the right fit for, for funky marketing. I love company. that. Hired, right? You hired her hundred percent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Still going to it, but I think we'll, we'll get there. You better hire her or I'm going to hire her. <laughs> yeah. Man, thank it, you. Man. Thank you for this. Thank you for taking time and just chatting about things. We should, we should definitely repeat this and talk more. Uh, and yeah, just I uh, wish you have uh, a nice day and just like guys, if you want to talk more about sales or if you want to get educated about sales, about not only strictly sales, but all the things that surround sales, I recommend you follow Jake and go to his uh, YouTube where like all kind of things can be found there. I find it also entertaining, not only educating and that's Good. what's important. Awesome, man. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day.